In today's Bible study, I want to answer a significant question, and that question, what is Europe's role in final Bible prophecy? If you follow our teaching, uh, by now you have figured out that we like to open the Bible and focus upon some of the difficult passages, questions, comments that revolve around the subject of Bible prophecy or eschatology. And I've been dealing in our teaching with nations one by one and showing you what role they play in final Bible prophecy. I've done teachings on Russia, I've done teachings on China, I've done teachings on Ukraine, the United States of America, and so on. And in this series of teaching upon nations and the roles that they play in final Bible prophecy, this is significant. What is Europe's role in final Bible prophecy? And we're going to learn some very unique things today, especially when it comes to taking a look at the evolution of the European Union. But in our study today, I want to take a look at some remarkable prophetic insights about Europe that are found in the Bible. And I'm going to focus my attention upon four profound questions. As always, we encourage you to take notes, have a Bible, have a way of taking notes, have a highlighter. But if you're taking notes, here are the four questions that I want to focus upon today. Question number one, where is Europe in Bible prophecy? Question number two, what is Europe's role in end time prophecy? Question number three, is the European Union setting the stage for the arrival of of the Antichrist? Is the European Union setting the stage for the arrival of the Antichrist? And number four, and this will be incredibly uh, revealing the details of fulfilled prophecy in this fourth question, why does the European Union use satanic symbolism? Now, this will be new for most of you. You perhaps are not aware as to the depth and the strength of satanic symbolism in the European Union. But when this study reaches that fourth and final point, you will be gobsmacked at how this fulfills Bible prophecy. And so if you have your Bible, open with me if you're a new student or a new believer, to the book of Daniel, which is in <clears throat> the Old Testament. Daniel and the second chapter. Daniel chapter 2. And I want to begin reading at verse 26, and I'm going to read down through verse 35, reading out of the New Living Translation. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 26, the king said to Daniel, <clears throat> also known as Belteshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And I want you to take your highlighter and I want you to run it through those powerful words. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. There is nothing in our life hidden from God. There is nothing in our past, present, or future hidden from the eyes of God. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. Highlight that. 
you dreamed about coming events. This lets us know that this was not just any common dream. It was a prophetic dream. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron, and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. We always begin our time with prayer, and so uh, let's take a moment and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you today for life and health and strength. Everything good in our life has come from your gracious hand, and we give you praise. We are grateful that we have even a copy of the Bible when so many in the world do not yet have a Bible in their own unique languages. And so as we open up the sacred scriptures and teach today, I pray for every listener and for all those who perhaps you have supernaturally connected to this time of teaching, I pray that you would reach to them and help them to understand that the Bible gives us absolute insights into this chaotic time in which we live. And you know the future. And you know exactly what is going to happen. And through the prophets of old, you have given us insights as we reach into the scriptures today and read and study and meditate. I pray that you will help us to make these truths very clear. I pray especially that not one person who's listening today would not be ready to meet the Lord when he returns. And so for those who need you today, may they be reminded that God loves them, that you gave your only son Jesus to die on a cross, and his blood was shed to cleanse us from every sin and to break the curse of transgression in our life. I pray that you would make yourself very real to every single individual. And for all of these things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. About 2,500 years ago, the Jewish people were being held captive in Babylon. And it was hundreds of miles away from their homeland. And one of these captives was a young man by the name of Daniel. Daniel had been handpicked by his captives along with some of his friends, and they were trained, and they were highly educated, and they were given special treatment, and Daniel became a prophet of God. And it's a remarkable book, the book of Daniel. Daniel penned one of the most significant prophetic books in the entirety of Scripture. The Old Testament book of Daniel walks hand in hand with the New Testament book of Revelation. And though they have incredible, remarkable, overlapping prophecies, they were written over 600 years apart. 
The author of the book of Daniel, of course, is Daniel. The author of the New Testament book of Revelation is John, oftentimes called John the Revelator. And these are two significant companion books in the Old Testament and New Testament that are core in our understanding of Bible prophecy. Now, Daniel received a prophetic vision from God that was given to him in two distinct dreams. Uh, these two dreams that Daniel received offer for us as readers a panoramic view of world history that began with the days of Daniel and conclude with the final kingdom and the second coming of Jesus Christ when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will return to establish his eternal throne. The first dream is recorded in the second chapter of the book of Daniel, and this dream was not given to Daniel. It was actually given to King Nebuchadnezzar. And though he had this vivid, remarkable, prophetic dream, he had no idea as to how to interpret it. He called all of his wise men, magicians, sorcerers, all those in his kingdom that he thought perhaps could offer insight and interpretation to his dream, but none of them had a clue. And he was getting ready to execute all of them when Daniel intervened and on behalf of these wicked men, he said, spare their lives. I have the interpretation to the king's dream. Now, the second dream is found in Daniel chapter 7, and it's Daniel's dream about four beasts. Now, the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 and the dream or the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 are very much the same, but in two distinct dreams. These dreams were recorded by Daniel in 535 BC, and they provide remarkable detail as to what the future holds. Now, as I've already mentioned, we're going to focus on four specific questions about Europe and its role in final Bible prophecy. And so if you're taking notes, let's begin with number one. Number one, where is Europe in Bible prophecy? Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 have oftentimes been called the ABCs of Bible prophecy. That's how important these two chapters have been to scholars of eschatology down through church history. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, oftentimes called the ABCs of Bible prophecy because it's these two companion chapters that the prophet Daniel describes four great world empires that would rule over Israel in succession. Now, because we live in the 21st century, we are afforded the hindsight of looking at world history and seeing the fulfillment of what Daniel saw in those dreams and vision. Because history records these four empires, and uh, this is important, and I would encourage you to include this in your notes, because this provides a great evidence to the strength and the believability of Bible prophecy when you stop and think that Daniel in 535 BC prophesied that in all of world history, there would only be four major world empires. And living now in the 21st century, we know what the fulfillment of Daniel's dreams implied. The first dominant world empire was the Babylonian Empire. The second world empire was the Medo-Persian Empire. The third in history we know as the Greek world empire. And then the fourth, and perhaps the most known by students, would be the Roman Empire. 
But Daniel prophesied that there would be four and only four world empires in world history. And not only did he prophesy them, he gave to us the distinct clues to interpret exactly who they would be. And what is perhaps most remarkable to some is he gave them in perfect succession. This is a remarkable evidence for the authenticity of the Bible that you hold in your hand and for Bible prophecy when you consider that Daniel prophesied not only would there be four world empires, but gave us clues as to exactly who they were. Now in the 21st century, we see the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, and Daniel gave them to us in perfect succession. Now we also know from the prophecy of Daniel and the prophecy of Revelation that there is going to be a revival of that fourth which is the Roman Empire, and we'll come to that. Now, these four empires are pictured in the dreams and visions of Daniel as four metals in a great statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had seen in the dream from God. And let me just take a few moments to explain this to you. And again, this would be a good time to write some notes. Number one, the head of gold represented the Babylonian kingdom. The chest and arms of silver represented the Medo-Persian empire. The belly and thighs of brass represented the Greek empire, and the iron, of course, represented the Roman empire. The feet and ten toes of iron and clay that were described in the dream and the vision represent what I just mentioned the prophesied revival of the Roman Empire in the last days prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that this revived Roman Empire is going to be used in the last days to facilitate the arrival of that one world global leader whom the scripture identifies as the Antichrist. The stone kingdom in the dream and vision that Daniel writes that came and crushes all the pieces and filled all the earth, of course, is a representation of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishing of his eternal kingdom. And of that kingdom, the Bible said, there shall be no end. Now, for sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the lengthy passages, but the interpretation of Daniel is found in the book of Daniel and the second chapter, verses 36 through 45. And I would encourage you, perhaps as you're watching, you can even hit pause right now and read that passage, and it will give you some insight as to where we're headed But again, for sake of time, Daniel's interpretation of the dream and the vision is found in the second chapter of Daniel, verses 36 through 45. Be sure to write that down, and in your time of study, be sure to read that. In Daniel chapter 7, the exact same empires are pictured as four great wild beasts that come up out of the Mediterranean Sea. Babylon is described as the lion with the wings of an eagle. Medo-Persia is defined as a lopsided bear with three ribs in its mouth. Greece is described as a leopard with four wings and four heads. Rome is described as a terrible beast with teeth of iron and claws of bronze. The revival of the Roman Empire is described as the ten horns with the little horn. The ten horns with the little horn is referring to the revival of the Roman Empire and the Antichrist kingdom. Now, The geography of all of these prophecies, of all of these empires, of all of these nations, 
from the time of Daniel and even before the time of Daniel up until modern times, the geography of this would be found in what we now call Europe. And so that is how we begin to hone in upon discovering Europe in final Bible prophecy. That brings us to question number two. What is Europe's role in the end times? Now, many of you that are listening will be from European nations. And I want to be clear to you. I love you. The Lord loves you. I don't want you to take offense at this. But I must love you enough to properly interpret the scriptures. And just as China plays a role in final Bible prophecy, just as Russia plays a role in final Bible prophecy, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, etc., there are 15 nations mentioned specifically by name in the final chapters of Bible prophecy. And so if you're from Europe or your nation is a part of the current European Union, please don't take offense at this teaching. You have the ability to make decisions on your own separate from the leaders of your nation. Whether your leader in your nation from wherever you're viewing is a righteous leader or an ungodly leader has no effect upon your ability to make a decision to serve the Lord, to love his word, to learn his word, and to live his word. Daniel's prophecies about these four world empires were literally fulfilled, literally. But one final phase of that prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. And that final stage is the revival of the Roman Empire. As Daniel envisioned it yet to appear on the stage of this world, it will emerge prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's also fascinating that in uh, Revelation chapter 13, also in Revelation chapter 17, the Bible in this New Testament companion book, again, Daniel, one of the main prophecy books of the Old Testament, Revelation, one of the main prophecy books of the New Testament, these two are companion pieces there are overlapping and accurate prophecies in both the words of Daniel and in the words of John. But in Revelation 13 and in Revelation 17, the Bible also prophesied, just like Daniel, that there would be ten kings symbolized by ten horns, and they're mentioned in conjunction with the revival of what we oftentimes call the Roman Empire. They're found in Revelation 13 and 1, Revelation 17 and 3, and also Revelation 17 verses 12 through 13. And again, if you want to pause and write those down and read those verses, I hope that when you listen to our studies, I realize that uh, this type of depth in teaching is not something you're going to be able to retain in totality. Many people uh, write and email and message me and say, I listen to all of your videos multiple times and every time I re-listen, I hear something new or I learn something new. Well, the same could be said of myself. I'm a, a devout uh, reader of books and I love to study and read. And I've read the Bible since I was a child over and over and over. It's amazing to me how many times when I pick it up and read it, there will be something there that I have not seen before or something new that the Lord teaches me. Now, one of the important things in this study that I want you to understand concerning Bible prophecy is that the Bible prophesied a future confederation or alliance of 10 world leaders who will encompass the same basic geography as the ancient Roman Empire. Now, I've heard some errantly teach on this subject, and they refer to ten nations. But the Bible doesn't say ten nations. It says 
10 leaders. And so if you're listening to teaching and individuals are trying to force nations into the fulfillment of both Daniel and Revelation's prophecies, then you know that you're listening to a teacher uh, that needs to do a little more studying and a little less teaching. So let me clarify that. And I want to say this humbly, but it's very important that you understand this. It is not 10 nations that the Bible speaks of. Let me give you an example of that. I keep hearing people say that the revived Roman Empire and the European Union uh, will be fulfilled when we see it finally condensed and settle into an alliance of 10 nations. I've heard a lot of teaching on that. I've heard a lot of prophecy teaching on that. I've had books that I've read from individuals that have made that mistake. So let's clarify that. The Bible does not require 10 nations. It speaks about 10 world leaders. Now, according to uh, Daniel and the uh, second chapter and the 40th verse, the Bible tells us, and the fourth kingdom shall be a strong, as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Uh, when we study this concept of iron and it representing the Roman Empire in the dreams and visions that Daniel writes about, iron is mentioned 14 times. And when we think about iron representing Rome, it really is not a stretch at all. Uh, it's easy for us to see in the 21st century with hindsight looking back what Daniel was prophesying about and say, wow, he had no idea that that would be fulfilled in such a detailed way. But in the 21st century, when we think of Rome and the Roman army and the Roman legions, etc., and iron, it was often said that iron uh, was what they ruled with, an iron fist. Rome possessed superior iron. They were actually known for making the best iron in the world, and their technologies for producing iron was, as far as industrial uh, technology goes, the Roman Empire made the best iron in the world. It was known worldwide that the iron of Rome was by far the best. Uh, it was often said in history that the Roman Empire ruled the Mediterranean with an iron fist. Uh, it's often said in Roman Empire writings in history that she crushed her opponents beneath an iron heel. And so I don't have to spend a lot of time on that. Just in your notes, write down, Rome is iron. And so as we're looking into these prophecies and we're studying in particular Europe's role in final Bible prophecy, we've already taught you that there is going to be a fulfillment uh, of Daniel's dream and vision, uh, most all of which was fulfilled except for what? That one piece of prophecy, 10 kings, 10 horns, one little horn. That refers to the coming revival of the Roman Empire and the arrival of the Antichrist. We do know that from the study of Scripture and eschatology that there will be three stages in which the Roman Empire will be revealed. Uh, first, the Bible says ten kings will appear within the boundaries of the old Roman Empire, and they are a group of ten described in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. So from our vantage point, we want to keep an eye on the world, and in particular that region of the world, to see potentially ten major world leaders that will arise from the chaos of the mess in which we now live globally. Secondly, the Bible says that a strong man, whom we understand to be the Antichrist, he will emerge from these nations, and he will consolidate these ten leaders and the nations that they represent into a united empire. 
Uh, the Bible also gives us a significant detail about identifying the Antichrist because it tells us that as he's trying to establish rule and perhaps dictatorship in this region of the world, that three of the ten leaders are going to revolt against his dominance and his lack of diplomacy. And what is the response of the Antichrist? The Bible tells us that he'll have those three world leaders killed. There's been speculation by some, and I give no great depth to it, and I cannot be dogmatic about it, but many people say perhaps this is where the United States exits from the pages of final Bible prophecy. Perhaps there will be a world leader in the office of the presidency of the United States who will oppose this and make known his desire. Perhaps he'll have other nations, and there's speculation as to what those other two world leaders may be. But the Bible doesn't give us enough on that to be dogmatic. Is it possible? Perhaps. But I certainly am not going to teach it as prophetically factual. But what we do know is whoever those three world leaders are who oppose this aggressive advancement of dominance by this one world leader whom the scripture defines as the Antichrist, those three world leaders will be assassinated, executed, or killed, and they'll be replaced. And in their replacement, that will quell the resistance against the Antichrist. By the way, this is found in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 8 and verse 24. Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 17, uh, tell us that the ten kings will then turn their kingdoms over to the Antichrist. And at this point, the Antichrist will rule over a united Roman Empire. And then the third stage is that the Roman Empire will, by declaration or some type of edict or covenant, will extend its power not only over that region, but over the entirety of the world. As you have heard me teach before, out of Revelation 13, the Bible prophesies five specific political agendas. If you've not heard that study, it is one of the top ten of my teachings on Bible prophecy that you need to listen to over and over and over until you understand it. Because once you understand the five political agendas of final Bible prophecy, and I believe it is on the channel by that title, the five political agendas of final Bible prophecy, then you understand everything that's going on in our world today and why we have such frenzied chaos. What are those five political agendas? The Bible prophesied a one world leader a one-world government, a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and a one-world military power that will enforce it. And so this Roman Empire, this revived Roman Empire, will extend its power over the entire earth and make the Antichrist the ruler of the world. Now, the Bible tells us exactly how long this term will be for the Antichrist. It's only going to last three and a half years. And the Antichrist kingdom, his world kingdom of three and a half years, will culminate and terminate at the Battle of Armageddon and terminate with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That brings us to question number three. Is the European Union setting the stage for the arrival of the Antichrist. Is the current 21st century European Union setting the stage for the arrival of the Antichrist? In 1946, one of Great Britain's greatest leaders, Winston Churchill, said this, and I quote, The tragedy of Europe could only be solved if the issues of ancient nationalism and sovereignty gave way to a sense of European national grouping, 
he went on to say, the path to European peace and prosperity on the world stage is clear. We must build a United States of Europe, end quote. Winston Churchill said that. He said for there to be prosperity and peace and function in that region of the world, prophesied by Daniel, prophesied in the book of Revelation, Winston Churchill from his throne, from his vantage point said, we must establish a United States of Europe. And quite frankly, that is what the European Union is becoming. Daniel describes this future coalition as a mixture of iron and clay. Now remember, iron is Rome. And clay represents the will of the people. This coalition of European nations consolidate different backgrounds, different languages, different traditions. This all represents the clay, the people, the will of the people, the history of the people, the traditions of the people, the languages of the people, etc. And when you try to mix something as strong as iron, Rome, with the alliances of other nations, languages, traditions, cultures, etc., they just do not mix. Even when the clay is baked to make it harder, you still do not have a mixture that will stand the test of time. This mixture in Bible prophecy represents an outward structure that brings people together out of their own economic concerns and fears without unifying their underlying identity. It's a forced and awkward relationship. And that's a good way to describe what Daniel saw when he interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's vision and he got down to the base of the statue where there was iron and clay, again, iron representing Rome, the Roman Empire, the revival of the Roman Empire, but the clay representing the alliance of all of these other European nations. Lastly, and I close with this, why does the European Union use satanic symbolism? Now, you're going to want to pay attention because this is actually quite frightening if you've never seen it before. And I have a series of pictures to help you to visualize these prophecies of the Bible. But it's also interesting to note that the European Union appears to be attracted to symbols from the Bible that were always used to describe or to depict the opponents and the enemies of God. And as I was doing some research and editing before presenting this to you today, that was my question. Why does the European Union seem to have this unnatural attraction to such blatant satanic symbolism? In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible tells us, Then I witnessed in heaven, and they're going to put that verse up on the screen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. What a remarkable prophecy. Because the flag that was created to represent the European Union has 12 stars representing the primary symbol of their alliance. I find that fascinating as a student of Bible prophecy. That the Bible prophesied in the end times and that through the scriptures as we live in these days, if no one is teaching you these things, and this is why uh, it is so important for you to have a trusted source in your life to understand Bible prophecy. 
This is why I don't do uh, five-minute or seven-minute videos. I cannot teach you the qualified substance of Bible prophecy with people who have a drive-through mentality about the Bible. If you are going to be a serious Christian, you must be a serious student of the Bible. And I humbly and oftentimes ask, I would like to be, and it's something that I'll have to uh, earn. I can't demand it of you, but I hope with time I will become a trusted source for understanding the Bible, difficult questions, and in particular Bible prophecy. But how about Revelation 12.1 where the Bible actually prophesied those 12 stars? Another main symbol of the European Union is that of Europa, which is a woman riding a beast. And the statue of that is uh, on display and is in uh, symbolism, not only in the main statue with the European Union, but it is used quite frequently. And in Revelation chapter 17, the Bible identified the woman as a harlot who is riding a beast which represents the Antichrist and his kingdom. Why does the European Union embrace this blatant satanic symbolism straight from the pages of Bible prophecy? One version of, uh, many of you know that they have their own currency, the euro, and uh, those that are watching in Europe, perhaps you have a, a two euro coin. But if you look at the two euro coin carefully, you will find, and this is the one representing Greece, it proudly displays this harlot riding this beast mentioned in Bible prophecy. Again, the question, why the attraction to such clearly satanic symbolism. The leaders of the European Union are educated men and intelligent men. These leaders surely must know the symbolism that they have chosen and the symbols that they use to represent this European Union. Now, I personally believe you can take this for what it's worth. I am not saying that the European Union in its current state is the finalized, prophesied, specific revival of the Roman Empire, but I have no doubt, I repeat, I have no doubt that the European Union is preparing the stage for the arrival of these five political agendas and the arrival of the Antichrist. And friends, if that's not enough, the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, the architectural design was actually and purposefully built to represent the unfinished Tower of Babel. And the implication is that the EU is going to bring the world together at last. And this, of course, is what the Bible describes as the main goal and objective of the coming Antichrist. This modern nod to the Tower of Babel by architectural design in its main global sanctuary where they meet, there are 679 seats in that global gathering chamber. All 679 seats are allocated to its membership but one seat is not allocated, and one seat no one has ever sat in yet. It is being saved for I wonder who. Because, wait for it, the number of the seat that has yet to be occupied of the 679 seats is seat number 666. And I know that sounds outrageous, but you can do your own research and you'll find that what I'm saying is absolutely accurate and true. 
679 seats in the parliament building, architecturally designed to represent the Tower of Babel, one seat not occupied, and the number of that seat is 666. Gradually yet steadily, the nations of Europe have come together. Rome is more integrated today than it was in the days of Jesus Christ. And since the time of the Roman Empire, there has been no world, no governing nation or empire that has ever been able to attain global dominance. Napoleon tried, Hitler tried, Stalin tried, they all failed. There will be a short period of time in the future, however, when one man will succeed. And he will come somehow, perhaps out of this European Union, but out of this revived Roman Empire as prophesied both by the prophet Daniel and by John in the book of Revelation. And this ruler from Europe, from the group of ten, will take control of the European Union, and this man will become the very first promoted and accepted and recognized one world leader. Yes, the Antichrist will be the first. Many have tried, all have failed, because prophecy has already set the course, and God's words never fail. Heaven and earth, the Bible says, will pass away, but my words will never fail. Friend, as you've listened to this study today, and I've gone through some of the significance of Europe and the European Union and the stage being set for the arrival of the Antichrist, and I've concluded by showing you such definitive satanic symbolism. I've read passages out of the Bible that describe them and fulfill them. How can you not see that we are closer to the end than we have ever been before? What is Europe's role in the end times? You could bring it all to boil into a couple of points. Europe's role in final Bible prophecy is globalization and the consolidation of all world power. The return of Jesus is nearer than it has ever been. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, No man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But in that same chapter, Matthew 24, it also writes, You will know when it's nigh even at the door. And friend, I conclude by telling you, it is nigh, even at the door. Daniel chapter 2, Jan Daniel chapter 7, the ABCs of Bible prophecy. I hope today I've been able to give you some insights and understanding to be better equipped to realize that the Bible is abundantly accurate and historically true and everything that it says will come to pass exactly as God has prophesied. But what's the action step? The action step is you need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? And if not, would you pray with me right now? And when you're done praying, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org. It'll be on the screen. And I want you to click on New Beginnings and follow those easy prompts we have some teaching that I've made specifically for you. If you're a brand new Christian or you're coming back home to right relationship with God, I care about you and I want to help you. And that's what this channel and all of our content is about, is helping men and women and boys and girls live every day ready to meet the Lord. If you need to pray with me what many people call the sinner's prayer, let's do that right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me and make me holy in your eyes. Come into my heart today and be my Lord 
and my Savior. I receive salvation now as the gift of God by your grace and by your mercy. Today I'm saved and I'll never be the same. Strengthen me as I walk for you. Use me to win friends and family to Christ and to be the example of faith that you've created me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.